so we've been doing a special series on Tier 2. And so far we've done one on um, setting up a screening system and also on family and community engagement. So those are recorded and will be on our website if you've missed those. Today's um, topic is intervention planning. And we have a part one and a part two because there is so much around it. Um, what we're really focusing on with part one is the features of evidence-based interventions, trying to use data to match supports, and then a plan for some delivery of supports. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about um, some different ideas for interventions, but we can't stress enough that this is just one piece of your entire system of Tier 2. So um, I'll probably say that multiple times throughout the chat, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page as we start. So here's our triangle, and what we're focusing on today are our supplemental interventions and supports. So we know that um, our goal with Tier 2 is to provide remediation because we want to make sure that we prevent problems from getting worse. We want to have a continuum of supports. So that's part of the reason why we'll show you a bunch of different interventions is that we really need to have a continuum as part of Tier 2. We want to identify and support students at risk for not reaching behavioral expectations and we want to also make sure we provide sufficient and appropriate interventions. And we'll be focusing a lot on that last bullet as well. So we're using our multi-tiered model because we want to help children get help early. We don't want to wait until they need intensive interventions. And we want to make sure that what we're doing is evidence-based. So that's where we are in the series right now. There will be chats on progress monitoring, problem solving, and how to make some um, decisions. And I'll refer to some chats that already exist and some resources that already exist on our website uh, around some of that information as well. Uh, we can't stress enough that if your data show more than 15% of your students need Tier 2 supports, that's really a Tier 1 issue. So a lot of times we'll hear folks say, oh, about 50% of our students really need Tier 2. Well, that is a sign that something is not ha happening that should be happening at Tier 1. There's the whole idea of having supplemental services is that they are supposed to be not as intense as Tier 3, um, and they're not meant to be for large, large groups of students. So we want to make sure that we're determining our core is effective for around 80% of our students. And we're going to use multiple data sources to identify students needing additional supports. Um, we do have a chat that is around identifying students, and I'll give you that link in a moment. And we also want to think about the potential function of behaviors. And I just want to stress here, too, that it's not um, we're not talking functional behavior assessment at this point, but we do want to make sure that we're considering function. Another piece that um, is truly important around your Tier 2 system is grouping, so that we're going to group students together who have some common needs. Uh, you'll see the link at the bottom. We do have a chat that's completely devoted to grouping. So I'm just going to go over a couple of quick things um, for folks to be thinking about in case you're not. Um, we want to consider if students have similar instructional needs. Um, we want to think about if they have both academic and emotional behavioral needs. Are, there, are the students' academic needs similar, or are, do they have functions of behavior that are similar across students? So if you take a minute, um, I'd just like to know, how are your school teams currently grouping students at Tier 2? So what are some of the um, answers to those guiding questions, or what are some of your methods that you currently use uh, to try to group students effectively? So I, if you have some sort of rules of thumb or data pieces that you've been using, we'd just like to hear from you about how you're currently doing that. So I see Lisa's typing. And it's, uh, it might be that currently you um, are not doing it. <laughs> it could be currently that maybe what you're doing isn't leading you to the path that you want. So I definitely encourage you to review our online chat where we provide a lot of resources so that we can make the most efficient use of our time um, after we've identified students to make sure that we're grouping them accordingly. All right, so I see a, a multiple people are typing, so I just want to wait and see what they say. Okay, so some, uh, you have a group for check-in, check-out. Okay, great. Um, we know that, that I'm going to guess that chances are that they are benefit from adult attention, so maybe considering some function there um, might have been an indicator. Um, grouped by same academic needs based on assessments. Okay, great. 
and you also group behavior groups <clears throat> depending on what you see red flags with. All right, um, which is also a, a, a really good um, piece of data to take a look at. Um, schools should have defined data decision rules. Yes, as part of your tier two system, um, there should be some decision rules, and I'll refer you to that chat as well, um, all around how we make some decision rules. But yes, we want to consider how many minors this, that the students might have, how many absences, OSS, ISS, all kinds of things that we typically are gathering as part of our PBIS program. And I see one person is still typing, so I'll just give them a second before we move on to the next slide. Um, the link that's at the bottom of this slide will take you to all of our monthly chats. And um, the decision rules that I just referred to is, on, is under that tab, as well as our Tier 2 grouping. So thank you all for jumping in and adding some additional information uh, for folks to consider when they're grouping. All right, I'm going to keep moving on, but feel free to keep typing. Um, what we want to think about with function of behavior at Tier 2 is, again, it's not an intensive functional-based assessment. We're not talking about that piece. I think oftentimes where we see our Tier 2 systems sort of fall apart is that people go from Tier 1, um, jump right into Tier 3, which we know is an intensive um, function-based assessment. Oh, oh, good. Thanks, John. We have a check-in, check-out as well as a group to focus on ESOL. All right, great. Um, we want to think about with function, what is the behavior that occurs repeatedly? Because if it's occurring repeatedly, it definitely serves a purpose. And um, it's getting that student's needs met somehow, even if it's not the way that we would like to see their needs being met. We also have to consider that the same behavior might serve different functions. So I might be disruptive in class, but that's because I'd like everybody to be paying attention to me. Um, Another student might be disruptive in class because they want to avoid a non-preferred task. So the same intervention for the same behavior might be counterproductive if the behavior serve different functions. So even though we might um, want to treat all of the students who are really exhibiting this disruptive behavior and we have this group, we want to really be careful that we're still addressing the function and getting to that piece when we actually are delivering the interventions. Because, as number three states, which is um, interventions are more effective when they're aligned with the function. So just consider that as we're talking about selecting interventions and as we're talking about um, ways to deliver those. All right. So a lot of times in our, um, when we're looking at our data, maybe we've done a, a team nomination, maybe we've used a universal screener, we see some natural groups start to, to show themselves, right? Um, our top left is what we're calling our academic behavior skills. You know, the students who are disorganized or always are forgetting their homework or just lacking some of those skills around academics. It might not be that they are falling behind in reading or math, but they really need some of those academic behavior skills. Um, maybe that's their lack of bringing in homework that's impacting their grade. A lot of times we have students who need what we're calling here is pro-social skills. So our students who might have anxiety, um, they might be our, more of our students exhibiting some internalizing behaviors. And then lastly, we might have our students who we typically think of as going into anger management groups. I think I prefer the term problem-solving skills. Um, they're lacking those in terms of you know, how do I handle frustration? How do I handle disappointment? How do I handle disagreements? Uh, so those would be problem-solving skills that that group would need. And a lot of times, our students naturally fall into one of those three groups. However, we mentioned before, we have our students who have many different needs. So this top group <clears throat> has academic needs. They need some help with their math. But at the same time, they also need supports for frustration. So when they hit a point where they're getting frustrated um, doing something related to math, as I'm delivering their supplemental supports for math, I can also instruct them how to handle the frustration. And maybe I can teach things like how to, how to ask for a break appropriately. I don't need to have two separate groups, one for math and one for frustration. I can really teach those skills within a group that already exists. 
And, the, and my second group is a, is a reading group. And they really need to learn how to use break cards because they are getting, um, they're getting upset and they're getting frustrated. But I don't need to pull all of those students separately and take more time away from class. I can do that within the instruction that's already being provided to them in that small group. OK. So now what? Um, we've grouped our students and we've decided what it is that they might need um, based on our data and our multiple sources of data. So now we need to match the groups um, with an evidence-based intervention, and, and we're not going to forget function in that. So when we're talking evidence-based interventions, we're really talking about some things that have critical features to them. So there's research to support that, that intervention. And the research has been done on similar populations as the population that you are supporting. There should be a method for progress monitoring. We want to make sure that what we're doing is working. So when we are selecting an evidence-based intervention, we should have a way of monitoring if the student's getting those skills, is better at those skills or not. Um, and there will be a chat that I'll advertise for you at the end specific to just progress monitoring. There should be a way of checking fidelity so that if the, when the intervention is being delivered, we know it's being delivered the way it was meant to. And it should also be validated by some um, systematic da data collection. We want to really avoid those, oh, I think it might work, or oh, it sounded so great because I went to a session at a conference and it promised me that I was gonna, it was going to fix every student that I had. I know as a teacher I fell for that a couple times. Um, we want to avoid those kinds of things where, the, where when they say research, they're really just giving you some testimonials. It's not the same thing. Um, we want to avoid those interventions that just have a few studies or data to support them. We really want to look at the quality of the research that's been done or if there's studies with inconsistent results. So those are the things that we want to make sure we're steering clear of. All right, so we have levels of evidence. Um, maybe not everything that we're doing is that number one, you know, top best way of um, the evidence that we'd like to see, those randomized control groups. Um, maybe there's more of experimental studies that have been done. Um, maybe it's more qualitative. There's been interviews, surveys, focus groups. We're not going to discount that um, as a level of evidence. And maybe we're seeing some student outcomes and some student successes with what we're doing within our system that we can also use as a piece of evidence. So you want to evaluate what your school already has in place. There's no need to ever recreate the wheel um, or toss out what you've been doing, um, especially if what you've been doing has been showing to work. But you can download this form from the share pod in the bottom left corner. And um, it just really helps you go through, you know, if you're doing an intervention, I know some people have said that they're doing um, a, a check in, check out. Um, or maybe you're doing a small group um, on social skills. Just make sure that it has the research to support it and all of those other really key pieces um, that I mentioned. It's a good thing to just periodically check, maybe uh, especially if, you, if you're thinking of adding on an intervention, to make sure you have all those pieces in place. A lot of times there isn't a system to progress monitor, so we need to make sure that that um, is a yes. Okay. So this school, I'm going to give you this example. Um, this, they have the needs of the students versus their ex existing interventions. So the needs of their students are some internalizing behaviors that are impacting friendship skills. They're seeing that as a group. They're seeing um, a group that has some academic behavior skills, which is, they need some help with organization and with homework. And the bottom sort of got cut off, but there's also a group that's handling anger and handling disagreements is very, very difficult. So what they have right now in place are lunch buddies, weekly guidance groups, and behavior contracts. So when you look at what the students need versus what's existing, what would, do you feel like the school might need to consider um, as they are looking at their interventions and then matching that to the needs of their students? So if you go ahead and type in the chat box, I'd like to hear some ideas of what this school team might need to think about as the thinking about their interventions that they have versus the things that they definitely need. So is what they have going to meet the needs of all of the students that they identified? OK, right. We'd want, we definitely would want to know about the weekly guidance groups. Um, is it handling um, 
disagreements and anger, or is it on a completely different set of social skills? You know, are those weekly guidance groups meeting the needs of that group who needs the problem solving? Okay, right, so there is a need for problem solving skills. Maybe we could address it through weekly, weekly guidance groups. If that's not happening, then we need to make sure we're creating um, a time for us to specifically go over how do you handle a disagreement? How do you handle it when you get angry? Okay, I see a couple more people are typing. So I'm just going to go ahead and wait. Right, so behavior contracts. Um, often, is that going to um, really <clears throat> help our students if we're thinking about grouping students? So um, exactly, Jenna said they're typically individualized, so maybe that's not the best tier two intervention that we really um, should be using. Often we're doing student by student by student. Um, we want to really make sure that at what we're doing with lunch buddies, is that I, something that's systematic? Is that something that we're progress monitoring? How do we know it's being done with any kind of fidelity, if you, especially if you have multiple um, lunch buddy kinds of groups? And um, Colleen adds the organizational skills. To me, when I look at this, compare these two lists, I'm not 100% sure what would address those academic behavior skills. Perhaps a group that taught some homework or organization, but I would really want, if I was this team, I'd want to seek out some additional support um, for that specific group. Okay. All right, so where should we start? Um, this is where I'm going to try to jump off and also show you um, what some of the different websites look like. All right. And I'll double, ch I'll make sure that you all are able to see it. Okay. So um, if you could go ahead and just type in the chat box if you're able to see that. And um, before I start talking about it and nobody's able to see it. Okay, so I just want to make sure. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. Okay, so that link that I gave you, um, and you can, um, oops, and you can get it from the uh, from the PowerPoint is out the What Works Clearinghouse, and maybe some of you all are familiar with it already. Um, it's a good place to start in terms of thinking about what is really evidence based, and really at the top, remember that big arrow when we wanted to think about what was best. This is a good place for us to consider. And you'll see here to the right, um, there is a icon that's just for behavior. And there's also a resource about um, preventing and addressing behavior problems. And those are tips from the What Works Clearinghouse. So each of these letters has some more ideas. But remember, we're not just pulling out ideas and applying them um, to every student that we have who we think might need additional support. If I was the team that we just talked about, we would really want to be seeing if there are some academic behavior skill supports, if there are some homework or organizational supports. Um, for the problem solving group, I would want to do the same. So that is one place to start. I'm going to put us back up here and stop sharing. Okay. So I've, I've listed a, a couple different links here for you, and um, I'll go ahead and show you to where on these links are some good places to get information. Um, again, thinking about the fact that we want to consider the needs of our students first, and the part of our part two of planning for interventions is going to talk about scheduling, is going to talk about personnel, it's going to talk about who's going to deliver these interventions. Today we're really just focusing on what are, where are some potential places that I can find some evidence-based Tier 2 interventions. Okay, so my um, formatting got a little bit, um, uh, looks a little bit awkward here, but um, when we're thinking about this, we're going to keep thinking about it in those buckets. So we're going to go over some interventions around those pro-social skills. So we're going to talk about actual social skills curriculum. But we're also going to talk about self-regulation and anxiety, because those are oftentimes the groups of, of students that we're missing. Um, we're going to talk about how you can address those academic behavior skills through things like BEP, which it sounds like some folks are already doing. Um, and there's a resource for academic behavior check-in, check-out, and also a program called HOPS, which is Homework, Organization, and Planning Skills. 
Um, we're going to talk about those problem solving skills as one bucket as well. So we're going to review some things like I can problem solve, prepare, um, PATH, which, which stands for promoting alternative thinking strategies, and second step. Some other ideas to consider um, is our mentoring. So we're going to go over a good resource for that. And um, especially if you're currently doing something around mentoring, talking about how we can make it truly a tier two intervention so that we have all of the necessary pieces that we need. Okay. So if we are, all of the things I showed you in the previous two slides are things that we could purchase. And um, when I made the comment earlier that we want to make sure that we're not just falling for what sounds so great while we're sitting in a session, we want to make sure that we have some guiding questions for evaluating our vendor products. So again, we always want to go back and see, um, I loved this curriculum I saw. Let me see if it's on the What Works Clearinghouse and what's the level of evidence for it. Um, I also want to make sure that the strategy has a manual for describing the procedures for each step so that anybody would be able to implement it and we could definitely do it with fidelity. Which brings us to the next bullet which asks about is there a method of fidelity? Does it come with um, a tool that will help me make sure that whoever's running um, the groups or whoever is implementing that intervention is doing it with fidelity? And then lastly, very important, um, we want to make sure that the strategy can be implemented without intense involvement from the developer. So oftentimes we read about um, the research that was done, but it also had six graduate students with it. Well, we know that we don't have six extra people traditionally sitting around the school um, hoping to find something to do. So we want to make sure it's something that could be implemented without all of that support. All right. So here's our disclaimer for our chat. Um, the following slides are not comprehensive. It doesn't cover every single possible um, intervention, and it's meant for um, just awareness. It's not meant for you to just pull one out of the website and then go try it. Um, it's just meant to be part of your entire system. So what you definitely want to do is after this, um, look at, of course, go back and look at your data. Look at what already exists. Don't reinvent the wheel. And then review additional evidence-based interventions than the ones I'm showing you today. And then do additional research of your own because what might work for school A might not work for school B because we're talking about two different sets of students, two different communities, two different ways of work. And always, always, always make the choices based on the needs of your students. Okay. Um, so we have um, a resource that's in the bottom left corner and it is called um, Academic Behavior Check-In Check-Out. It's a modified version of the BEP that contains um, a morning check-in, a daily report card, and a homework tracker. And then it has an afternoon checkout along with a home component. So I'm just going to share it. Um, you can download it. I'll also share it right now because I pulled it up um, prior to the chat. At least I thought I did. Oh, here it is. Very first one. Um, so if you look through it, it does come with um, some really specific directions and some great materials that are really meant to address those academic behavior skills that I was referencing. Um, I just told you I pulled out the really big key ideas to, more, and I said morning check-in and the daily port, uh, point card and homework tracker. This manual goes through um, what all those things actually mean, what they should look like, what the home component should look like. And then at the very end, it does give you some of those materials and um, uh, just example of what a daily uh, point card could look like uh, and what a student agreement to do this could look like. Uh, you can always modify those daily point cards if you already have something that you're using that's similar. But it's a great uh, manual to, to go through and to see how can we actually help address some of those academic behavior skills that our students are missing. Alrighty. Is there anybody um, on the chat today who is doing something like that within their check-in, check-out or within their BEP where they're specifically addressing some of those um, organizational skills within schools? You can go ahead and type if you are. Okay. All right, so if you're not, that's definitely something to consider. I know um, as a former teacher myself, there was always students I had who 
um, would have benefited greatly from having um, some type of organization, some type of um, method for somebody to check in as they were trying to acquire those academic behavior skills. Uh, the next strategy or intervention I'm going to show you is something called coping cat. And it's meant to address anxiety, so some of those pro-social skills that we talked about before. Um, is anybody using this intervention? And this might be something that's done more by a school psychologist or counselor or social worker. But I was just wondering if this was something that anybody was currently using. And I'll show you some of the features about that, too. Okay. So either you're not using it or people have stepped away. Um, I'm going to go with you all are still there, and I'm just wanting to see what it looks like. Okay. Um, so I used that link to get to here. And you'll see over um, on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of different options for thinking about um, what you might need. So there is a workbook around um, Coping Cat, and that is for uh, ages 7 to 13. And then there's one that's meant more for adolescents. So that's also something that's also available in Spanish. They have a brief one, so there's only eight sessions, and they also have a manual that comes along with it. There is a resource for parents, which is always a wonderful thing, and that's one of the components that we talked about um, that's really important is the home component. And if you didn't get a chance to see the family um, chat, that is something that goes into a lot of detail about the importance of that. So that's something to consider looking through. And one of the big suggestions I have is asking some folks in your district if that's one, um, a material that exists already. It could, it's very possible that other folks in your district are using it. And if so, then I would definitely talk to them and see um, how it's working, how they're setting it up, and um, any uh, tips or suggestions they have. Um, on the handout that is the PowerPoint, you'll be able to actually read the link. Um, it's a little bit hard here because the formatting got a little bit skewed. Okay. Um, I can problem solve. Are there folks who have been using this intervention as part of their Tier 2 system? So here we're really thinking about exactly those students when we called it problem solving skills. We're thinking about those students who um, need some help when they're handling their disappointment, when they're frustrated, when with other students or with adults. And there's a whole bunch of examples of what those lesson plans look like in your, fair, in your shared file at the bottom. Um, I think it's really helpful for you to be able to take a look at those because you can see I put um, an example right here. It states the purpose of what that lesson is supposed to be and the materials that are needed. And more importantly, too, there's a teacher script. So if I'm running an I can problem solve group and you have a second adult who might be doing it, then you're both saying the same things. You're using those same words. Um, you're going through the same way of modeling. You're practicing. And you can see if it's a good fit for you when you look at some of those sample lesson plans. There are different levels um, for the ICANN problem solve, so you can make sure that it matches the developmental needs of the students that you have. OK. How many folks are using a mentoring program? And if you are, how do you know if it's successful? So I always, um, before I show you this, I wanted to just ask if folks are already doing mentoring and if, what data they're using to see if it's um, making improvements. OK, so I see a couple of people typing. Uh, adult mentoring, sorry, I should have been more specific. Okay, so you look at grades. So hopefully you, that you're hoping that the mentoring um, at the high school level might show an impact on grades or having some improved grades. That's um, a great piece of data to look at, and that's one that we're already collecting. Um, right, so a lot of your schools are using mentoring, but it needs to be a little bit more data-driven. That's always a concern. Any other schools or districts using a mentoring program? Okay. So this um, tool that's here is um, also, again, in that file share at the bottom. And it's a, it's a wonderful guide. And I put the snapshot here because it has a lot of tools for those instances where what we're doing is too informal. 
um, and it helps to really guide you to make sure that your mentoring program is successful. So there needs to be some real purpose in the designing and planning. So a lot of that information there is talking about how do we match up students and adults so that it's the most successful thing it could be. Uh, then they give you some additional tools for managing the program. And what I love about this tool is it does give you some ideas for evaluating what you're doing and um, some criteria for seeing if it's actually working or not. And if you do have something that's already in existence, it's a great tool to say, okay, what we're doing is wonderful, but we need to add a couple of these pieces or um, to gain some additional ideas for making our mentoring program more successful or for even determining if it's successful to begin with. Um, I hear mentoring listed all the time as a tier two intervention. And it is a wonderful intervention if you match the needs of the student to the mentor. And if we also make sure that we're progress monitoring and it's being done with fidelity, which this handout, I mean, with this guide helps to really make sure that, that you're doing. Okay. Mind Up is another curriculum. It's meant for pre-K through eighth grade. So there's three different books to it. And this is more, again, for your, um, your students, pro-social skills. Um, it could actually be used as a tier one um, support. Lots of schools have adopted this. <clears throat> And um, they're doing it in all of their classrooms. But it's also really great if you're pulling a small group together who might be having a lot of trouble with anxiety, um, a lot of those internalizing behaviors that we talk about. So you'll see um, it's actually for each of the books, there's, it's pretty much organized the same way. So you have your first unit, which talks about how do you even get focused. Um, they do a lot of lessons around the different parts of your brain and what you're accessing when you're having some different feelings. They talk a lot about mindfulness. Um, then they're having each lesson is having um, the teacher to explain pieces of it. And then there's a lot of activities for the children to do um, to actually practice some of those skills. Uh, the other piece that I like about this is there's a component, too, that we can make sure that our teachers are using that same language if we're only using it as a tier two intervention. There is research behind it. Um, and it, although it is a rather new curriculum, there has been some real um, rigid studies done um, around the effectiveness of it. So it um, also sort of lends itself well to some of the trauma-informed practices that we've been talking about and the different parts of your brain and how it can impact your behavior. So that's another thing to consider as well. And you can just look that one up at mindup.org. Okay. Um, we have Second Step. How many folks have been using Second Step as part of their Tier 2? I'll just give you a second to think about. And again, too, this could be used as a Tier 1. Lots of times folks are using it um, for small groups. Okay. Oh, great. So you're using it in all schools. Wonderful. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about using this as a Tier 2 uh, intervention, we want to think about, great, oh good, K2, wonderful, start, start it early, right? Um, I'm a big believer in that. So it, every lesson gives you uh, what it, exactly what it's about. Um, there's opportunities that shows you if you're doing it as a class, what kind of class discussion you could have if you're doing it as a group. Um, the other piece, too, is has a home component to it. And it also has, if you're pulling students out and you're going to be doing things like teaching empathy, um, or in this case, being assertive, you want to make sure that the teacher is able to support that intervention when the students go back to the classroom. So second step has um, a really nice component to it as well, where um, you can share with the teacher, as we know you should be doing, um, we can share with the teacher the kinds of words that we use, the kinds of skills that we are practicing, and it gives them the opportunity to keep using those same words and reinforcing what was learned in that small group. Okay. And then we have the classic, which is skill streaming. And again, when there's one for elementary and one for adolescents, I'm going to um, also remind you that there's some example lesson plans in the bottom left-hand corner. But this is um, a curriculum that's been around for a while, and it has a lot of evidence behind it. The, <clears throat> the way that it approaches 
teaching is through modeling, role playing, performance background, and generalization, which we know are the key pieces to really having some effective instruction around behavior. Okay, good. I see some folks are using skill streaming. <clears throat> So we also want to think about that it's not, but it doesn't take very long. We're not, if we are pulling groups of students or if we're pushing in to work with groups of students, it's not intended to be an hour long. It's meant to be um, something that's really quick. And the wonderful thing about skill streaming too is if we've identified a group of students who have some real specific needs, we can pick just those lessons to do. It's not like we have to go through a certain amount of sessions. Uh, before we get to the piece that we need to, we can just really focus on that with the students who um, need it the most. Um, Stephanie wrote that she knows of a district who uses both second step and skill streaming as a school-wide curriculum. And when the students are struggling with the skills, they get more intensive direct, uh, instruction. So that is the beauty of both of those um, curriculum is that they could be used as a tier one and they could also be used um, as a tier two intervention. All right. I wanted to show you um, a couple more resources that um, about a couple slides ago I had showed you um, the What Works Clearinghouse. And I wanted to also show you some of the other sites that were on that same uh, slide and what you can find with them. So castle.org was one of the resources that I had shared in the slide that had all of those links on it. And a lot of times people go to it and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So we're just trying to think of, you know, it has been broken down specifically. So depending on at what level are you supporting schools, um, maybe you are at school based and you are supporting the students, maybe you are at the district. So there's some different resources depending on um, where you are, and what level of support. And there's also some examples of what social emotional learning can look like at home. So, if you click on any of the resources, it will take you to some more information. And they have a lot of great things that are already in existence. So if it is something that you're thinking, oh, I have this group of students, and I already know that they have this need uh, because I've looked at my data, but that's something that we are missing, uh, I would definitely go, come and look at this site to see if there are resources that already exist. Um, it does give you some additional ideas about um, evidence-based programs. And I love the guides that they have. Um, they also have them broken down by preschool, elementary, and then a middle and high school edition. It's oftentimes difficult to find a lot of resources um, for the high school level around social emotional learning programs. I think we're getting a lot better about it um, as we're talking more and more about this social emotional learning. But all you have to do is fill out the form and you'll be able, they'll email you the guide. So it's not like you have to um, pay for anything. So that's something that um, I would consider. Uh, I showed you the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, SAMHSA is another uh, site that I would go to. Um, a lot of times the interventions on this particular site are meant more for our school psychologists or our social workers or our counselors. But what I think about with this is if I'm a team and we are really struggling to meet the needs of um, a group of students that we have, especially around those internalizing behaviors, um, I might want to see what's out there and then again, then ask if this is available in our district. Um, you know, a lot of times in schools we get really isolated and we only really know what's happening in our school. And there might be some of these already happening in your district, but you just need to ask around. So if you ask your district coordinator, that would be a great person to start with. Um, if you have a, you should have a school psychologist on your team, that would be something that um, I would want to ask about. So that's another resource for you where you can go right to um, some specific topics. If you've looked at your data and you know what you need, um, and then they have a lot of evidence based and a lot of research behind what works around mental health. Okay. All right, let me stop sharing my screen. All right. Um, so I just provided you with lots of information and lots of different um, interventions to go to. Um, but what we really want to think about, and I probably have already said this uh, about 10 times, but con to consider the needs of the groups you've identified. And to also just make sure you're keeping it simple. Uh, tier two is not meant to be intensive. It's not meant to be tier three. It's not meant to use a lot of resources. 
So one of our big focuses with all the whole chat series is how can we just keep it simple? So one intervention might meet the needs of multiple students. If, if I already have a behavior education program in place, um, I can think about are there students who can naturally plug in there who maybe don't have those um, externalizing behaviors that we traditionally see with students who go into a BP, but maybe I could just add on an academic component. I could look through a guide and see what one or two tweaks could I make to, so that I have a BEP that's going to specifically address some of those academic skills. Um, begin where your largest needs are. Now remember, if you have more than 15% of your students are all really struggling with um, anxiety, that's more of a tier one issue. But maybe you've identified a group of students um, who really just need some specific social skills. Well, second step is a great place to be able to look at what kinds of skills could, do they need, where can I pull some lessons on those skills, how can I make sure I measure the progress and I'm doing it with fidelity. So if you are really struggling with your tier two system, you don't need to begin with 100 different things. You could begin with two very simple ideas that might meet the largest amount of students who you've identified. And um, you could really start off by <clears throat> making sure you're doing those two things very well. And then if you do find that you have additional needs, add on from there. Um, of course, you want to progress monitor and evaluate that the interventions are effective. So those are the, the topics of two other chats that will happen um, through the course of the year. If you are trying to consider some decision points that was brought up at the very beginning of our chat, you know, how do we identify students? We do have a chat that's devoted just to that. Part two of this um, is going to address those staffing issues, scheduling, and fidelity. <clears throat> because a lot of times folks say, you know, we know the kinds of interventions our students need, but who is going to do it and when? So that's going to be the topic of part two. Any questions that you have that weren't addressed? I know I put a lot of stuff out there for you, but um, sometimes I feel like it's better to have a lot of information and you can pick what you need, pick and choose, um, rather than just trying to guess what you all might need. Okay, so I see somebody's typing. To see it, um, if there are any other questions or maybe if there's something that you've heard about that perhaps we could um, answer something about. Maybe, or maybe an intervention you're trying um, that you want to share that's been successful. This is a good time to connect and um, see what other places are doing throughout the state. All right, so I'm just going to wait um, while Fran is typing. Okay, good. All right, good. So I'm glad it was helpful. Uh, I think that a lot of times um, we do need something a little bit more specific. Um, and you know, traditionally, the reason why we don't do this, um, why we're doing this as a chat, is to have it as a supplement so that as you're doing your entire Tier 2 system, if this is a piece that's um, a little bit tricky or a little bit difficult, a lot of times we are doing the, the groups that we do because we've always done them and the person who does them really likes them, um, not considering the fact that maybe they're not meeting the student's needs. So it's good to have some other ideas. Um, and especially, too, I'll just go back to a lot of folks overlook that internalizing piece or how do I have an intervention for that. So that's something to consider as well. Are there any other questions before I ask you your thoughts on the chat as a whole? All right. So if you're wondering, I really came here for the scheduling. I came here for the staffing. Um, well, that part two is going to be on November 9th. Um, from 3 to 4 Eastern Standard Time. Then we are going to do a chat on progress monitoring in January, um, one on problem solving at Tier 2 as a whole in um, February, and then one specific to secondary settings. And that will happen in March. If, there's any, uh, if you know of a school who's doing well um, with their Tier 2 system, please feel free to type that in the chat box or to let your district coordinator know. Um, we're always looking for folks to share the ideas and the tools that they use to build a successful system. Okay, I see that Lisa's typing, so I'm just going to let her finish. Okay, 
But yeah, it, it can be overwhelming um, to decide which to use. So I always go back to your data. And again, try to just keep it as simple as possible. If you're already doing something and it can just be tweaked a little bit, then by all means, keep doing that. Um, there's no need to keep running out and trying something new. Um, you want to go back to your data. You want to go back and make sure that it's being done with fidelity. And you want to make sure that your students are making progress. But as a whole, um, just trying to keep it as simple as possible. You can always add on uh, to things that you're doing. You don't have to try to do everything at once. Um, and again, just try to think of what meets the needs of most of the groups that you have at Tier 2. And always review something before you think about even making a purchase. A lot of times, if you just call the company and ask them um, you know, that you want to just preview it, a lot of times they'll send you just a preview copy. And then you can see, you know, is it really working? Would it just really meet our needs? Um, is it too intense? That kind of thing. Um, I really wish I was a squeakier wheel when I was in the classroom. I didn't realize you could do those things. So don't forget, you could, you could call the publisher and just explain to them you're thinking of trying this um, and see if they're able to help you out with any kind of samples, things of that nature. Okay. All right, I will stick.